This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, and you're listening to Python's Paradise, your film and music show, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, Stephen Joyner has been really great to me this year. Uh, He's my first guest of the year, and uh, following him was just a slew of great talents that uh, he's been affiliated with, and... uh, I have one on with me tonight, and uh, an interesting guy. <laughs> I've watched part of his one of his movies, and um, I gotta say he's much more entertaining than a lot of the people I'm seeing in some of the mainstream movies I'm seeing now. I'm talking about Nick Santa Maria. Or, N- Maria. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> how you do, Nick? How you doing, Greg? Good to, good to uh, talk to you. You're in California, right? Yeah, I'm in. Uh, I'm in Los Angeles. Los Angeles. What, what's it like there right now? Right now, it's uh, the weather's beautiful. It's sunny and uh, mild. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, I yeah, I can hear you fine. Terrific. Yeah, there's a nice breeze, and uh, yeah, it's, it's it's rush hour here in Los Angeles, which means you know the cars are. Uh, uh, thick on the freeway, <laughs> but it really is a beautiful, beautiful day. The weather's been gorgeous. Yeah. Well, how about, uh, how about up there? Well, well, we are getting into the spring of the year. We still got a lot of snow on the ground, but oh uh, April is generally when things start to clean up. And uh, we've, well, I know back in February, March, we had a couple of nasty snowstorms. In fact, I come out of here, I remember it clearly, uh, February 9th, I did an interview and I ended up getting out of here about 12.30 midnight, and when I got outside, there was a big snowstorm. It took me like five minutes just to get out of the parking lot. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I haven't experienced that in a long time. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of winter or winter driving or or snow combined with freezing rain. Not my cup of tea, you know, but... <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I, I grew up in winter. I grew up in New York. Okay. And, uh, so we, we had a nice winter. It wasn't it wasn't uh, as bad as a lot of places in the country, like the snow belt or anything, but I got a taste of it. And I have to be honest with you, I much prefer the winter to the summer. Why is that? Uh, I just, I would rather be cold than, than hot. You know, you could only take off so many uh, garments uh, when you're hot, whereas... If you're cold, you could lay on as many as you'd like and keep warm, you know. But then again, I may be talking, uh, you know, as an amateur because I've been living in Los Angeles for about, oh boy, I think that I guess it's my 16th year here. Well, I know you did a movie where taking the garments off was the norm. <laughs> oh, are you talking about the uh, bikini beach race? <laughs> yeah. You know, that had three titles, that film. I made that back in 1992, I think. And uh, it starred Dana Plato, uh, who was, um, what was, the, what was the name of that sitcom she was on? Different Strokes. Uh, Different, Different Strokes. Stroke. Yeah. That's right, that's right. And then I believe she had one. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, it was an uh, interesting experience, let me put it that way. And I'm glad I didn't have to take off my clothes. <laughs> Well, we'll get to that uh, film in a minute. Um, oh, boy, they must be waiting at the edge of their seats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I know when uh, Steve introduced us the other night, one of the things that caught my attention is that you were willing to trash some of the films that you were in. And I'm like, you know, I I was already hooked to interview you just on that because I didn't want to disappoint anybody by looking at their credits and saying, gee, uh, He's done this or this. I didn't like. What's he done that? But, but uh, I mean, I found fa- I found enough in one film that I would definitely talk about. But um, w- not everybody is willing to uh, to say, you know, I did a shit movie. I know. I call a spade a spade. I'm I'm a uh, I'm a film historian as well as an actor comedian, and um, I've been studying film since I was probably, I don't know, six, seven years old. 
And I know, I know classic films. I know good films. I know bad films. And I've been in some substandard trash. <laughs> let me tell you. Let me tell you that. Um, and I call a spade a spade along those lines. What, why, why should I lie? I've never been ashamed of what I do in the films. I always think I deliver, but the films themselves, well, we'll, we'll talk. Well, you know what? I'm actually a member of the Golden Raspberry Award Foundation, and I actually ah. joined it in response because I of uh, Pearl Harbor, which is a film I hated so bad I was angry <laughs> leaving the theater after seeing that. But I didn't. It made, you, it made you long for the actual event. Oh, I hated it. it, it well, what bothered me is that. Um, I read an article where uh, in the newspaper where they're trying to figure out uh, how they were going to sell this movie to Japan, and uh, they decide they'd sell it to them as a love story. And I'm like, you assholes, you know? <laughs> a love story. Yeah, like I mean, it's bad enough, you know, that there's no three dimensional Japanese characters in the movie. It's just three idiots, uh, two idiots <laughs> fighting over a nurse, basically, is what it is. Yeah, yeah. They pretty much tried to turn it into, like, Top Gun, you know? And I didn't like Top Gun either, but... I didn't either. <laughs> yeah, I I, either. I, I, as popular as Top Gun is, uh, all I see is a bunch of cliches, and then you and Kelly McGillis p- appears there in the end, and we're supposed to be shocked? <laughs> I know, huh? How about that? Yeah. I, I feel like the 1980s was uh, when cinema just started going down the toilet in general. I know a lot of people long for the 80s, and it's sort of like the the target nostalgia um, era nowadays. But I I got news for you. I think a a lot of the dumbing down of culture started in the 1980s. There's a lot of it, but there's also a lot of great stuff that came out in the 80s as well, you know? Name, Name three. A lot of great movies? Yeah, name three. E.T. the Extraterrestrial. That was that was in the eighties. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, nineteen eighty, right? Eighty. Nineteen eighty two. Okay. Actually, I can name ones just from nineteen eighty two because I'm sorry, but I love Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Yeah, that was a good movie. I yep. like uh, I like the Indiana Jones uh, movies. Yeah, when, Raiders well, of the, the Lost Ark. Yeah, I like the Raiders movie. Yep. Yeah, I'm I'm exaggerating. I'm talking about in general. I'm also I'm including television and music. But there's been overrated <laughs> stuff too. Like I I I love the soundtrack to Dirty Dancing, but I hated the movie. It was nowhere near as good as Saturday Night Fever. Oh, I agree. Saturday Night Fever at least was gritty. You know, it had that almost Scorsese yeah feel to it. Yeah. I love the 70s. I think the 70s were were really the last great, that was the last great era for filmmaking. You know, there there have been some good movies in the 80s and some good movies in the 90s and what have you. But um, as far as truly classic films, I think it stopped in the 70s, basically. Well, I, I I was born in the 70s, so... Well, there you go. See, you <laughs> you caused it, Greg. I'm I must have. I blame Actually, you. I joke. I was born in 1972, and I like to laugh because I, I mean, well, The Godfather and Cabaret and What's Up Doc all come out in '72. I gotta laugh at the fact that so many X-rated movies come out that year too, like Fritz the Cat. Pink flamingos, deep throat, behind the green or beyond the green behind the green door, excuse me, and uh-huh. <laughs> holy God. and I'm like woo, <laughs> woo, and you, and you came out. Yeah, 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 I came out, <laughs> and I mean that in the nicest way. But, yeah, uh, I I came out the same year. Divine ate dog crap. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing that, and it turned my stomach. I can only imagine what it did to her, him. Yeah, Um, but uh, I'm I'm more of a classic film fan. I mean, you know, I I may not be as exciting to your audience, but my my favorite films were made between 1928 and 1934. That was to me was the golden period of filmmaking. Okay, 1928, 1934. I can name some great films that came out in that era. I think I think Charlie Chaplin. Huh. It's known as the pre-code era, before the, before the censorship started. Well, I, I think Charlie Chaplin's best film came out at that time, which was City Lights. My favorite Chaplin film. Yes. My, maybe my favorite comedy of all time. 
Well, you know what was amazing about City Lights is that uh, it was the first time you see a silent film where a where words on the screen go beyond just bridging an understanding gap in the story. Because when you Absolutely. hear the word, yeah, when you hear those words, I can see now, they represent something beyond just something on the screen. <laughs> Maybe the greatest ending of all time. Of I agree. Time. Yeah, it was. Uh, that's a fantastic movie. Yeah. What do you think of Modern Times? I like Modern Times. That came after 1934, though. Well, that was 36. Yeah, but he, yep. it's still sticking to a silent format, you know, for the most part, and just uh, to me, it it said everything. It predicted everything that was mm-hmm. going to happen. You know, the whole mechanical and technological revolution. And the dehumanization Mm -hmm. of society. Oh, yeah. Chaplin saw it coming, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll I'll go tell you. You mentioned pre-censor. Well, um, 1932, of course, Howard Hawks made Scarface. And I know that was, that battled the censors. Yes, yes. Oh, great film. Great film. Yeah. I took some Uh, film courses, so, yeah. I yeah, took some... all good. You, you seem to know your stuff. That's great. Oh, we That's watched great. everything from Birth of a Nation up through to Raging Bull, you know? Yeah. Oh, I love Raging Bull. That was an 80s movie. Yeah, that was 80. <laughs> yeah. It got in just under the wire. Oh, yeah. I can name lots of great 80s movies. The problem is there's so many bad ones that get so much attention, you know? Maybe that's what it is. You know, when I hear somebody saying, oh, man, dude, I love the classics. Didn't you love Ghostbusters? It's like... Well, I did like Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters 2, I, I, I did it. not. I didn't, I didn't love it. I didn't think it was a classic by any sense of the imagination. It was highly creative, especially for the time it came out. There was nothing quite like it. Anyway, so <laughs> we were talking... <laughs> you don't like Ghostbusters. <laughs> Olsen and Johnson made a movie in 1944 called Ghost Catchers. Oh, I did not know this. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, there have been, there have been comedians against ghosts for years, for, for generations. And uh, uh, to tell you the truth, those didn't need all those special effects and everything. Although it was entertaining and all that stuff. But like I said, there are very few classics, true classics made. Uh, after the 1970s, at least in my estimation. Again, it's my opinion. My opinion. No, that's okay. You're allowed to have your opinion. I don't want to piss anybody off. But I gotta say, my my, fa- my favorite uh, uh, Hollywood beauty was uh, mainstream in the 1950s, and that was Grace Kelly. And I don't see wow. I don't see her being matched by anybody, especially today. She was gorgeous. Not just gorgeous, but classy. Yep. Know? I get, go- I get goosebumps. Woman. I get goosebumps when I watch Rear Window, and there's oh, James yeah. Stewart uh, laying there asleep in his chair, and the shadow is coming up over him, and then you see Grace Kelly's gorgeous face coming toward you, and then slow motion, she kisses him, and he wakes up. And I'm like, gee, I would love to wake up like that. <laughs> oh, that was one of the sexiest scenes, you know? Yep. And there are very, you know, to me it's like, there's, I don't know if you're, are you a Preston Sturgis fan? I know the name, but I, I have not explored his work. Oh, please do yourself a favor. He may be the wittiest writer uh, and quirkiest of that whole generation. He, during, from 1940 to 1945, he made some of the greatest comedies ever made. And one of them was called um, uh, The Palm Beach Story. And in it, uh, Claudette Colbert can't get out of her dress okay. on her husband's lap, and they're trying to avoid each other. They're splitting up, and he asks, she asks him to help him to help her undo her dress, and the tension, the sexual tension, as she's sitting on his lap, and he's trying to unhook this dress. It's just, it's so palpable. It's so sexy without showing anything, you know, without going there. It's just, it's just wonderful. And even going back to Grace Kelly, look at the uh, the um, sexual engagement between her and Cary Grant and To Catch a Thief with, with uh, the uh, fireworks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, definitely. Try uh, Notorious. You're talking Hitchcock. Mm-hmm. Notorious with uh, Ingrid Bergman and Cary Grant. Okay, yeah. yep. There's some scenes in that, too, that are just so sexy. But we've learned since then that Alfred Hitchcock was kind of a, kind of a sex maniac. <laughs> 
Well, you know what? Um, here's an impression I have. I actually had his granddaughter on my show. One of his, wow. gran- yeah, I interviewed uh, one of his granddaughters last year, mm-hmm. and um, had a great chat with her. You know, and a wonderful interview. But um, here, here's one it's something that I've come to. I, I don't know whether this is true, but this is my impression. When uh, Prince Rainier, whom I'm not too, uh, I'm not too big on, t- mm-hmm. decided to take Grace Kelly away from us all. Yeah, you know, Hitchcock yeah. wanted to cast her in Marnie, and I think Hitchcock was trying really hard to find another Grace Kelly after Grace yeah. Kelly uh, left cinema. Mm-hmm. You know, that's where Vera, that's where Vera Miles came in, and Janet Lee, and uh, what's her name, Tippi Hedren. Tippi Hedren, yep. Yeah, yeah, but you know what? Nobody, nobody matched Grace Kelly. That's for sure. And my impression was, I wonder if that secretly kind of uh, haunted him somewhat. You know, because he had yeah. used Grace Kelly in three movies. He used Ingrid Bergman in three movies as well. But uh, you know, well, yeah. Also, one of the great beauties of of the screen. Very sexy woman. Um, I got to meet Hitchcock's daughter, Pat, uh, yeah. at uh, the Cinecon Festival, you know, uh, at the big dinner festival. And what a sweet lady she was. Yeah. I am... I'm not sure if she's still with us. Oh, she's still with us. Is she? Yeah. I, I was looking for her for an interview, and I thought, oh, gee, she's way up there in her age, and I... I heard that she's uh, uh, her health wise is not the best, but yeah. I managed to find one of his three granddaughters, and uh, she That's came great. out. That's yeah. Great. yeah, and I got wow, that. I'm impressed, Greg. Yeah, I got that interview up on YouTube, and we had a pleasant interview. She, she talked about what he was like as a grandfather, and uh, we even did our top five uh, favorite Hitchcock films, going down for, going from number five up to number one. And I think wow. Psycho was the only one that appeared on both our list. Oh, isn't that funny? I just had a conversation with a fellow film buff, and we were talking about our top three Hitchcock films. And we realized that after those top three, it was almost impossible to choose four, five, six, you know, because there were so many ties uh, for number four. But it was pretty eclectic. It was My, my favorites, I think, are... Um, I love Shadow of a Doubt. Okay. I love uh, um, uh, Strangers on a Train. Oh, great film. I can't uh, understand how Robert Walker did not get an Oscar nomination. Yeah, for how did that happen? How yeah. did that happen? I know, I know he had trouble with alcoholism, and he, he pissed a few people off. And Hollywood is, you know, it's, it's basically a popularity contest. Mm-hmm. But um, he, was, he was a pretty controversial guy um, in that society. But uh, great film, just a great film. It's one of those films that when you turn it on, and you it, you might turn it on in the middle, but you have to go through the rest of it. You know, you can't turn it off. Um, and I think number three, uh, God, North by Northwest, Rear Window. Um, uh, mm, I don't know. Those two are, are are mighty close. I even like Dial M for Murder. Same here. Yep. Yeah, yeah. He was a hell of a filmmaker. Yeah, on my list, I, I, I think my favorite is uh, Rear Window. Yeah, that's a beauty. And I like To Catch a Thief an awful lot. It had some gorgeous scenery. Uh, of course, Grace Kelly being part of that gorgeous scenery. <laughs> the main the main part of it. Yeah, and of course, Psycho I like. That was mm-hmm. my first midnight movie was Psycho. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, of course, North by Northwest. I even liked Frenzy, which was uh, uh, quite Frenzy a risky film. huh? It was fun. Yeah. I enjoyed it. But, uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun uh, interviewing uh, Terry when I had her on here and mm-hmm. and uh, learning about Hitchcock. and uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that was, uh, I had her on um, uh, last year in May, so I got that up on my YouTube channel, actually, so. Well, for, for Hitchcock fans out there, on my Facebook page, uh, <laughs> a friend of mine posted a little, a sh- very short video we made. Uh, with me as Cary Grant, and my friend is James Mason, and it's a spoof on North by Northwest. Only it's it's a it's also a spoof on Who's on First. <laughs> so it's very funny. What do you mean? You, <laughs> you're assassinating who? You know, and of course the spy's name is who. Um, but anyway, if you want to check it out, Nick Santa Maria. 
Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I like a lot of the great classic filmmakers too, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you, you like, um, I, I can't I, I stand when I hear about these people that will only watch movies today because of CGI and they'll complain about older movies because of black and white or special effects. Like, I just had, um, for last year and the other day, I had a guy come on and talk about, uh, from the uh, Ray Harryhausen Foundation, and and you know he was a great stop motion animator, and I I've I met sell, him. yeah I've met him a few times, yeah he's a wonderful he was a wonderful guy, I had he did work work that stayed with me my whole life, you know when you grew up with that stuff, you know you think of it as the real stuff that's the real stuff. I did a tribute last year for the 35th anniversary of Clash of the Titans, and it was one of my favorite movies growing up and i still love that film and i uh, had somebody from the ray harry who's in com- foundation come on and um we uh, did a tribute to ray harry who's in and celebrated uh the 35th anniversary of clash of the titans and i had him on uh, just this week uh for a second tribute you know because there's all yeah. kinds of stuff going on at the Harry Hosen Foundation, and through that in, if that through that first interview, uh, it led me to being able to interview the lovely and gorgeous uh, Caroline Monroe. Yow. <laughs> talk about beauties. Yeah, so I mean that that's 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 fun for me. So uh, yeah. But, oh no, I grew up on him. I grew up on uh, um, especially uh, Twenty Million Miles to Earth. Yeah, and. Uh, um, What's the what's the big one? Oh, Jason and the Argonauts. Yep, was very big when I was a kid. Uh, the the uh, sword fight with all the skeletons. Yep, it's unbelievable. It's just unbelievable work. And of course, he was an apprentice of Willis O'Brien, who did um, Mighty King Joe Kong, Young, the Son of Kong. Yeah, uh, Mighty Joe Young, the yep. original. Yep. And uh, to be honest with you, I don't think any of the Kong films match the original for storytelling, for for heart. I mean, it's just. It's just a one of my favorite films. Absolutely, and that came out in that era that you were talking about between uh, t- uh, twenty-eight and thirty-four. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, nineteen thirty-three. But yeah. uh, comedy is my is my main subject. Is my is my subject of expertise. Um, I'm I'm sort of a uh, I've written articles and published articles about uh, the great comedians, uh, especially the classic comedians. And, uh, you know, there's some there's some I know that I, I'm wondering if you ever heard of. Uh, OK, bring some names up. How about Wheeler and Woolsey? Uh, don't know those. <laughs> OK, Bert Wheeler and Robert Woolsey. They made about 28 films um, from 1929 up until uh, Woolsey's death. Um, I think their last one was in 1938. OK, Uh and they were only second to Laurel and Hardy in popularity back then. And now they're almost entirely forgotten. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. Worth looking into, though. They made a few movies that still hold up today. Uh, another team I really like are the Ritz Brothers. Okay, I don't know Mark them Brothers. either. What's that? I don't know them either. How did that? <laughs> uh, I've got a book pending uh, publishing. Um, it's uh, it's called Comedy Crazy, 60 essays about classic comedy. And uh, they all have chapters in the book. So when it's published, uh, I'll send you a copy. And you, oh, can, yeah. you can check, you know, look into these people. Uh, I was actually a friend of uh, two of them, two of the Ritz brothers. And uh, they were, you know, they sang, they danced, they mugged. In fact, they were the, uh, Harry Ritz was the star of the act. He was the craziest of the three. And he was the main inspiration for Mel Brooks, Jerry Lewis, Danny Kay, Sid Caesar. I could go on. Wow. They thought he was the funniest man who ever lived. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. In I did, fact, I did. Sid Caesar, before he would go on stage, would always say out loud to himself, You're Harry Ritz. You're Harry Ritz. <laughs> Isn't that something? Wow. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I oh, yeah. I did I did not know about these. So I'm I'm learning a little bit tonight. Good, good. So am I. I'm also too. Another thing too, and I I hear um, uh, these people that argue that a movie's uh, 
worth it's based on. It's box office. Of course, you and I both know that's horse shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because I, 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 I hate that whole trend when it started that everybody's in on it now. Uh, everybody looks at the numbers. You know, even even the bus driver in the morning gets up and he looks at the numbers. You know, it's like, oh, boy, look, this is number one this week. Who gives a rat's ass? Did you like it? It's well, you know, let me anyway. tell you something funny. What's that? Beauty and the Beast, uh, Logan and Kong, Skull Island, are all playing up at the mall right now. You know what they all have in common? What? I haven't seen any of them. I haven't seen them either. <laughs> and it's I, and for, uh, I heard that Logan was really good. I heard that from yeah, a I few, did too. But I just haven't seen them. Um, I usually, if I go to a bigger film, I usually wait. Like I did see Rogue One, but I didn't see it until like a month and a half after it came out. But mm-hmm. but um, I, I it's funny because people talk box office. Well, um, in 1998, one of the biggest films of the year was Armageddon. And it was garbage. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting out of here. Yeah, but you um, want me to tell you I, what film really, really did well that didn't uh, didn't have the audience? Well, I saw it when it was in theaters, but it's got a bigger following now than it had then. Was The Big Lebowski? Yeah. Oh God, now it's a cult film. Exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. But a, I gotta tell you, the only movies I'll run to see because I, I haven't done that since oh my God, in in thirty years. The only movie I run to see is Woody Allen movies. Oh, I and love I Woody Allen. Not all of them are good anymore, but there's something about Woody Allen that just, I guess when I was a kid, when I was growing up, we had pretty much three comic forces in the movies. One was Woody Allen, one was Mel Brooks, and the other one, believe it or not, was Neil Simon. Okay, yeah. Now, uh, the Neil Simon movies were a little bit fewer and farther in between. Uh, Brooks's movies, I, I'm going to piss a lot of people off, but I don't think his movies are that great. Oh, uh, Young Frankenstein is a masterpiece. Well, I think it's a good movie. I don't think it's a great movie. Uh, I predicted every joke when I was a child watching it. I predicted every joke. Um, I just find his movies to be like kind of like overlong television sketches. Okay. Uh, with everybody kind of winking at the audience, and I get bored of that after a while. Woody's movies, they were intelligent. They, they, he was the Marx Brothers of our time. I of love the, the Marx Brothers, yeah. And early 80s. And he was the one who won my heart, you know? And so when he comes out with a movie, I support it. I, I do too, yeah. What about Monty Python? Well, Monty Python's a whole other thing. I mean, I was, I was, uh, it was like religion with me when I was a kid. When they started showing them on PBS, on public television uh, here in the States, I never missed it. And I would watch them again and again and again. And then when their movies came out, I was always first in line. I love so, their yeah, movies, they, yep. They, them too, them too. I, I'm sorry I, I missed them, but I guess I was talking about American, American artists. Yeah, and of course, uh, well, these ones aren't American either, but I still remember the Carry On movies. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The Carry On movies are a lot of fun. Carry On Cleo, in particular, I remember. Well, they're very Mel Brooks. They're very, they're very Mel Brooksian. Yeah. You know, they're spoofs. There's, uh, there's anachronisms. You know, they're winking at the audience. It's, it's that kind of thing. They're fun. I'll tell you. Um, but, yeah. but I don't take them as seriously as I take, you know, my Python. I'll tell you one filmmaker I do rush out to see his movies, though, because I just I, I I've liked everything he's done. Yeah, is uh, Quentin Tarantino. I haven't liked everything he's done, but I have to say he's interesting. He's, he's at least he's interesting, and he dares to be different. Yeah, you know, he's very I, very innovative and knows his craft. What was the name of? Um, well, I love that he said, uh, you know, I, I I didn't go to film school. I watched films. I love that. But um, what was the Western he did recently? Well, he did one was Django Unchained, and he did Hateful Eight. Yeah, Hateful Eight, I, I thought, was a real mis- missed opportunity. Wasn't well, crazy about it. I liked it, but I had to say I was so happy to see Jennifer Jason Leigh finally get an Oscar nomination because I've always liked her. Yeah, me too. I think she's great. Yeah. She's great. Yeah. yeah. Um. What else was I going to say? Oh, yeah, I just might. The big flaw in that film to me, when I watch a Western, I don't want something shot indoors. I'd love, I would have loved for it to open up, you know? Okay. Uh, it felt very claustrophobic to me. 
Oh, okay, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyway. But I'm going to say, though, that um, I did uh, check out uh, some of the stuff you did. Today, um, actually, uh, before we talk about any of your movies and whatnot, I just wonder if I could get some of your background. Oh, okay, wait, I'm turning, over, I'm turning around. Do you see it? <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> um, my background. Well, I was, I was born in uh, Brooklyn, New York, uh, like all great people. And uh, <laughs> like the Three Stooges and the Ritz Brothers and Mae West and people like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mel Brooks, for that matter. Uh, I was born uh, and raised on Long Island uh, in a lower middle class uh, environment, mostly in a Jewish neighborhood. I'm a full-blooded Sicilian, uh, raised Catholic. Okay. Of course, I, I turned my back on the Catholic religion when I was like seven years old when my brothers taught me how to cut church, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, I got a little tired of hearing that Christ died for my sins, you know. I was seven years old. I, I stole candy and I touched myself. I thought he was taking it much too hard. Um, you want me to tell you something? Um, I, I grew up in a Christian household, and I was baptized, and I consider myself a Christian, and I read my Bible. But I'm going to tell you one th one thing. There's a group in Los Angeles that I cannot stand. They're called Movie Guide, and they re review movies based on Christian standards. And they, I, I think, number one, they blocked me on pretty much everything because they're total assholes. Yeah. And uh, the founder of that group, I mean, they, they recommend garbage like Fireproof with Kurt Cameron. Oh, and, my God. oh jeepers, what an awful movie. <laughs> and, and then they'll blast, and it, like if anybody, I remember there was uh, other Christian uh, film critics that actually countered them. And, of course, they get accused of uh, uh, um, criticizing people of the faith, or turn, like, like, they're, like they're wrong. But yeah, there's yeah. a thing in the Bible called lying, and it talks about <laughs> lying. So when you're recommending yeah. these garbage like Fireproof, just because uh, it stars your beloved Kirk Cameron, and mm -hmm. uh, a total predictable movie, looked worse than your average TV film, but yet they slapped four stars on it. Oh, of course they're going to, you know, and anything to get uh, a Christian point of view. You know? And it makes Christians look bad, which ticks yeah, me off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, let's face it, uh, religion, uh, things done in the name of religion, haven't always been to, um, uh, what's, how do I want to phrase this without offending anyone? Um, a lot of things have been done in the name of religion that have been less than... Um, on the up and up, or successful, I should say. Uh, more people have been killed. Uh, more more causes have been uh, uh, um, <laughs> have been harmful. Uh, I just find it to be a very uh, it could be a very dangerous thing if you uh, ignore what it's all about. And basically, what it should be all about is love. Period. Well, I don't see that out of this group, and. Um... Like I said, I, as far as I'm concerned, this is my personal opinion. I don't trust Movie Guide or, or any of the people involved with it as far as I could throw them one hand across an eight-lane highway. Oh, yeah. Like I said, art, any art is subjective. What's, what's good to you may be bad to me and vice versa. And you know what? Neither one of us is right. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I said this to somebody the other day. Uh, it's an old quote, but it's, uh, you know... Uh, it, 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 I don't know much about art, but I know what I like. And that's yeah. basically all it is, you know? Yeah. And speaking so, of our art, you, 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 yeah. did a, you did a film in, I think it was 1992, called uh, Bikini uh, Beach Race. Race. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, was, actually had, it actually has three titles. Uh, when it was made, it was called um, The Cocoa Bay Bed Race. It was shot in Miami. And... Uh, then it was on television here in the States on a, a late night show called Up All Night. And then it was called um, The Sex Puppets. Okay. Uh, then when they released it on video and DVD, it was changed to Bikini Beach Race. Uh, amazing. Anyway, it was very popular in, in the Asian countries and in parts of Europe. 
Oh, yeah, I'd never heard of it until I was looking up your credits. and uh, Yeah, and you know what? You would have been better off not to, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does seem to lose a lot of focus. It's like, was there actually a director on this movie? Because it almost seems well, like he's just setting up... Was Eric, Eric Luzil, <laughs> okay. who was a... Um, I, in fact, on the set once, I asked him, what have you directed in the past? And he just said, I direct shit for a living. That's what he said to me. <laughs> And I looked him up, and that's pretty much what he did. He makes movies for, like, Troma. Do you know the Troma company? I know. Troma uh, is an American company. They made uh, The Toxic Avenger. Okay. And things like that. I think he did the sequel. I think he directed the sequel, which was actually better than The Toxic Avenger, the original. But um, still shit, you know? (laughs) So it was that kind of a thing. It was a low-budget Ron Jeremy, porn star Ron Jeremy played the villain in it. He played the mafia uh, Don. And uh, it's funny because we would go to locations and wait for him to arrive. And once he arrived and the people on the location saw that it was him, they would throw us off the location thinking it was a pornographic film. But he was actually trying to break into more straight roles, you know? Uh, I, I was just happy to be around a lot of topless women and, uh, I got to do some comedy. I got to do some real comedy in it and it was fun. Yeah. And of course, it's an awful movie. (laughs) Dana Plato was in it and, uh, she was sweet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was looking up some stuff on her tonight and, um, I, I'm going to tell you, and I, I'm a big, big, big Howard Stern fan, but I tell you, he uh-huh. took an awful lot of slack over um, her uh, her death. Yeah, he wasn't very nice to her. Yeah, I, I think that could have I, I think that could have been handled a little bit better. Um, yeah, me too. Not me too. The, well, he's not exactly the the bastion of taste, you know, or uh, <laughs> or discretion. Let's put it that way. Uh, but he is funny. Like, I'll give you that. Yeah, he can, I'm be, a big, he can be funny. I'm a big fan of his work, but I have to say, I, I felt awfully bad over the, the the Dana Plato situation. I tell you, when people call in and uh, you're under that kind of pressure, and um, mm-hmm. yeah, I I just I felt bad that she went the way she did. Yeah, yeah. She was she was a nice lady, and she cared a lot about her son. Yeah, but. Yeah. Um, Tell me about some of your experiences making Bikini Beach Party. Oh, or God. Or beach, beach, beach race, <laughs> excuse me, where women are raced on beds with wheels on them. <laughs> that one, yeah, which is based on an actual race that happens in Miami every year. They have a bed race, and, and uh, these people build beds with wheels on them, and they all have themes, you know, like a, like a parade float. And then they have a big race. And uh, it's, it's actually quite a, quite a big deal in Miami. Um, so this was based around that. And uh, I got to say, it was made for about $7. And uh, <laughs> the talent I was surrounded by, and I'm smiling as I say that, uh, other than, you know, the lead guy who was also the producer, uh, Xavier Barquette, okay. who died very young, by the way, just like Dana Plato. He died very young. Okay. Um, the curse of uh, Bikini Beach Race. Um, and, uh, uh, the talent was a little less than stellar. The script I thought was terrible. Um, I have one scene in it that I'm proud of, I have to say. What's that? And that's, uh, uh, there's a bar fight and I get to get up and imitate Curly of the Three Stooges and I end up getting punched in the face and I do this thing where I I fall backward into uh, my friend's arms. And when I got done with that whole sequence, the crew broke into applause, and that was a, a that was a proud moment. That's funny. But other than that, um, it's it's pretty unwatchable. <laughs> I had Curly's grandson on here through Steve Joyner. Yes, Curly, Brad. Yeah, Brad's yeah. a great guy. Oh, Brad. I'm a friend of his too. I, I think he's a great guy. I think he's a lot yeah, of fun. Very personable. A real nut. <laughs> how, how do you know Steve Joyner, by the way? How do I? I'm sorry? How, how do you know Steve Joyner? I know Steve through uh, mostly Facebook, uh, to be honest with you. That's how I met him, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's pretty much, they call it social media for a reason. And people are meeting that way. People are communicating that way now. It's a whole new world, which reminds me. 
uh, a whole new world. Uh, one of my best gigs was uh, at Disney, at Disneyland, actually. Okay. Uh, at Disneyland, there's another park right across the way that Disney also owns called uh, Disney's California Adventure. And on that, in that um, amusement park is a 2,000-seat theater, um, state-of-the-art, you know, Broadway quality, even better, uh, theater. And uh, back in 2002, they opened a, sh- uh, a show called Disney's Aladdin, a musical spectacular. Okay. And I'm betting some of your listeners uh, saw it because it ran for 13 years. Um, it was a multi-million dollar production. And they had trouble finding someone to play the genie. And they went to five different states. They saw over 700 people. And uh, I got the job. And I opened the show. I was with it for about 10 months. And it's probably my biggest claim to fame. I I hate to say that, but I did the uh, soundtrack. The CD is out there. It's kind of a collector's item. Uh, I made the front page of the L.A. Times uh, Sunday entertainment section. I got reviewed in the L.A. Times. Uh, I was interviewed in Disney Magazine. You You name it. It was a big deal at the time. But I was with it for 10 months. And then somebody from Mel Brooks's musical, the stage musical, The Producers, which was the biggest show in the world at that time, saw me. And the next thing I knew, I was in The Producers. And I was with them for five years. So anyway, speaking about Mel Brooks, I worked. I was Mel's boy for five years. And you mentioned bad movies. It kind of put me in mind of uh, my, my first podcast interview I ever did was with Tommy Wiseau from The Room. I was wondering, did you see that? No. Oh, yes, I did. Yes, I did. Uh huh. In fact, my nephew, my young nephew, showed it to me, and we laughed like idiots. <laughs> it's one of those bad films that, unlike something sh- shitty like Gili, you, yeah, yeah, Gili, you can't watch again. But the room, you can kind of watch again for the for the wrong reasons. <laughs> well, it's like watching a train wreck. You know, you can't look away. I don't know if you're a fan of Ed Wood Jr. Oh yeah, I know who you're talking about. Oh, I'm a big Ed Wood fan. His movies are, are, they're just, you look at them and you're baffled and you're amused and it's just amazing. There's two kinds of bad movies, and you mentioned it. Movies like Geely who, that are unwatchable, mm-hmm. or movies like Plan 9 from Outer Space or The Room that you just can't look away and you want to see them again and again because they're entertaining despite the fact that they're terrible. So where does uh, Bikini Beach Race land? I would say that's somewhere in between. <laughs> I, I actually have a very close friend. He's, a, um, he's the editor of uh, NCIS here in the States, um, uh, probably the most po- popular network show on television. And we, we grew up making movies together when we were kids. And uh, when that movie, when Bikini Beach Race was released to cable, it was in every hotel in America. You know, <laughs> pay-per-view. Okay. My friend was traveling, teaching people the avid system of editing. So he was in a different hotel room every night. He told me he watched the movie about 50 times. So maybe it's one of those movies that's so bad, so terrible that it's good. <laughs> and I'll leave it to you. <laughs> is it, well, there's been a lot of movies. Like it's kind of a Xerox of so many uh, movies like it, like like even Hot Moves. I interviewed. Oh, God. Uh, Con- College TNA movies. Yeah. You know, college kids and TNA. That's what it is. Yeah. Like and and I add a little bit of old style comedy to it. That's, they let me do pretty much every, anything I wanted to do. So you'll see gags, me doing gags in the film that really don't belong. Uh, you know, I do stuff that Red Skelton used to do. I, like I said, I do Curly. I do Lou Costello from Abbott and Costello. Uh, so it's kind of fun to watch it for that. Yeah, another film that you were in, uh, mm-hmm. this one I did <laughs> not care for, got a nasty review from me, and I, 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 I was really hoping it would be good when I saw it advertised, was Holy Man with uh, Eddie Murphy. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, I still haven't seen it. <laughs> I shot that in the early 90s, in again, in Miami, and... Uh, uh, I, I actually I was on the set 
doing my scene, which was going to be shown during the titles. Okay, mm -hmm. it's a very small role, but it's very visible. And uh, I remember shooting the scene, and Eddie Murphy coming in to the studio with his entourage, just like he was God, like he thought he was God. And I just I I had to laugh. It was it was ridiculous. It was it was like a, a spoof of a star, you know. Anyway, I shot my scene, and Betty White went on after me, and uh, a comic named Soupy Sales as well. And uh, it was fun. It was good company to be in. But it, I never saw the movie. Well, you know what? I saw the movie and wish I hadn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am the king of bad movies. I do more. I do better stage work. I, I've actually been on Broadway a few times. Uh, I'm, I'm more proud of my stage work and my stand-up comedy and improv and stuff like that. Well, but I do have a movie coming out, um, and this I'd like to tell your your listeners. Okay. Uh, I'm actually part of a fake 1930s comedy team called Biffle and Schuster. Okay. And uh, a producer here in Hollywood put up about half a million dollars and shot, you know how the Stooge uh, movies are 20 minutes long? Okay, yep. We shot about five or six uh, of those films in black and white. One of them is in color. It's a special. It's a, it's a musical, in fact. Um, but most of them in, are in black and white, and it's in the style of those movies. And okay. uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to be announcing this, but if this isn't going to be on until September, I imagine it's going to be announced by then. So I'm going to tell you we've got a, um, a DVD distribution deal with Kino Lorber, um, uh, they they release a lot of classic, a lot of modern films too, but a lot of classic films as well. Uh, and it's going to be shown in a few theaters around the country. Oh. So look out for uh, The Adventures of Biffle and Schuster. Oh, I hope we get that. Yeah, well, it should be on sale in Canada. I mean, and, and if any, if you just get the uh, DVD, it'll be on Amazon and all that stuff. So. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. The most fun I've ever had in front of a camera. More more fun than your bit part in Holy Man? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know really what? I out most of my best stuff in the Holy Man thing. Ed, Ed, knew, Eddie, Eddie I was Murphy. an improv comic at the time, and he knew I was. The director knew I was, and he just let me go. <laughs> but they left, you know, they left enough. Well, Ed, Eddie Murphy, when you see his stand-up and his impressions... He he does some great great stuff, and I think it's I applaud the fact that he's toned it down for you know because he's got kids you know and he wants to make movies that you know his kids can watch and I applaud him for wanting to be a great parent I applaud that, but yeah. he kind of lost um, kind of has a dividing fact uh, with his audience because you know you get the people that love Beverly Hills Cop and the Nutty Professor. But then mm -hmm. you got the movies like you know, Imagine That, and uh, oh, whatever that one there where he has the people in his head, and uh, yeah, yeah, oh, I, I lost interest in him a long time ago. And the Adventures uh, of Pluto when he, Nash, when he, and when he turned, when he lost his edge, I, I kind of lost my interest. I felt that way about Richard Pryor too. Yeah, probably the, one of the greatest stand-up comedians of all time, and then he started making crap movies you know and it's like ah, eh, forget it <laughs> they all seem to sell out after a while yeah and it's like i i think eddie murphy i, th I think he's a tremendous talent but Me it's kind of like Me you too. look at some of these later movies and it's like what why how, like what are you doing you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Well, he's giving, it's like giving up your mojo you know yeah he, he, he lost it Although Dreamgirls, I was quite pleased. He got an Oscar nomination there, and, uh, and mm -hmm. I thought he did a great job in that. Well, he's certainly capable of doing a great job, you know, and when, when you see him do it, you're reminded of that. But then he'll make, like, a piece of crap like, you know, uh, what was it, Daddy Daycare? Or was yeah. That? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> stuff like that. I, I just want to – those are going to be the, uh, you know, the movies that people are going to be shaking their heads about for generations to come. Yeah, and I'm, I'm pretty sure he still isn't shaking the memory of Adventures of Pluto and Ash. Oh, my God. Which was a I mean, major uh, flop. You know, it's like Bill Cosby with Ghost Dad and things like that. It's <laughs> like, you know, you, you gotta you got to play to your strengths. 
you know, keep doing great stand-up because that's what you're great at. It's like George Carlin. You know, George Carlin was great up until the last concert. Okay. You know? Well, yeah, George Carlin was definitely one of the all-time greats. I don't know what was going on with the last concert. Well, I mean, I mean he was great. Right, I'm saying right up to the end, he was great. He did okay. not sell out. Oh, the, yeah, okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah, he was fantastic. Oh, my favorite. Yeah. My favorite of all the stand-up comedians. And very clever that where he come up with the stuff, like the seven words you can't say on television, which pretty much they're saying now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, now that's all gone to hell. But I got to tell you, I, I more George Carlin had three different careers as a stand-up comedian. He was a very straight, you know, short hair, wearing a suit and tie comedian for a while. He did imitations. He did, you know, routines. Then uh, there was that middle ground where he started growing out his hair and he started being a little bit more adult. He was still doing routines and jokes, but it, they were more uh, they were they were more uh, adult, you know, for adults and more true to himself. But then he became sort of a a, uh, a an angry philosopher. He got rid of the jokes for the most part, and he just railed out against society. And that's my favorite George Carlin, the last. George Carlin, the one where he just kind of looked at everything and told us the truth. Yeah. You know? And, and boy, do I miss him. Do we need him now? Oh, boy, do we need him now. What about Robin Williams? Robin Williams, to me, uh, you know, he, his hero was Jonathan Winters, who I thought was superior to Robin Williams. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Robin Williams was a mile a minute. You know, first of all, I used to work the nightclubs. I used to work the comedy clubs in the early 80s in Los Angeles. I was one of the comedy store players. And Robin Williams used to sit in the back of the room with a, a tape recorder and steal jokes. <laughs> he was known as the joke stealer. And then he would go on the Johnny Carson show, on the Tonight Show, and use those jokes, and they became his. Oh. You know? Yeah, it, it was not a very good reputation. But he was um, he's the kind of guy that, you know, he threw everything. He threw eight million jokes against the wall, and five of them were funny. You know, I thought there was a lot of wasted uh, effort there. I thought he was brilliant in his own way, but uh, to tell you the truth, I could do what he does and do actually when I when I work. Um, Jonathan Winters, on the other hand, it was like it was like watching a master. It was like watching someone paint a beautiful picture in front of you. And nothing was wasted. There was nothing wasted. You know, we were talking about Eddie Murphy. What what did you think of the comedians of Saturday Night Live? I thought I I still think some of them are good. Some of them are not so good. Uh, the 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 uh, I think one of the worst things that had ever happened to comedy films was taking characters that were popular on that show and turning them into feature films. Uh, you know, for the most part. They just didn't work. Some of them worked. Some of them didn't. My one Most of my of favorites. Didn't. My fav. One of my favorites was the Blues Brothers. I love that. Yeah, I, I, I'm again a, a fun movie, but I, I, I honestly have a lot of trouble getting through it. It's just too long, too rambling, too unfocused. I, I'm a classic film fan. I'm a cl classic comedy film fan, and I'm, I have very, very, very high standards. And movies like that in 1941 and stuff like that are just, to me, they're, they're, they're messy. Uh, but they have wonderful moments. I feel that way about Mel Brooks's films, too. They, all of them have wonderful moments. But as films themselves, I don't think, I don't think they're all that great. Uh, overrated is the word I'm looking for. Um, but uh, that's me. That's me. And I, I believe me, I'm in the minority. I know that. I'm a real comedy film snob. Well, a lot of Saturday Night Live based uh, films, you know, did not uh, come across. I think Blues Brothers and Wayne's World were two of the exceptions, in my opinion. Were two good movies. You're right. Yep. They were two good movies. Um, but I have to tell you something, and this is in Canada's favor. Uh, I thought SCTV was a thousand times better than any Saturday Night Live season. Oh, wow. I thought it was the best sketch show ever on television with okay. the most talented cast. Okay. I, uh, I thought, uh, you know, uh, Eugene Levy and, and Joe Flaherty and uh, Dave Thomas and Rick Moranis, Catherine O'Hara, 
Andrea Martin, Martin Short, who I got to work with, and the producers. Okay. Um, I'm telling you. These John guys, Candy. Thought, what's that? You forgot John Candy. And John Candy, of course, who became a, a huge international star, both literally and figuratively. But, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, there, to me, that was the greatest sketch group ever on television. And I'm a big fan of uh, the old Sid Caesar show, Your Show of Shows which also had a great sketch uh, cast and great writers. But SCTV, I, I felt like they were writing it for me, just for me. Uh, the references, they did not talk down to the audience. If you weren't aware of those cultural references they were throwing at you, you were out of luck, you know, because they weren't going to explain it to you. Saturday Night Live, uh, by comparison, I thought was, I don't want to say lame. Well, a lot of seasons were lame. But, uh, you know, watching them read the sketch, the, when they're in a sketch and watching them read fr from cards, it was kind of like, you know, what am I watching, a Bob Hope special or something? It's, <laughs> it's like, I, I just thought that was kind of lame. Uh, but, you know, the first, the first cast, you know, John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd and Gilda Radner and Chevy Chase and all of them, talented, talented, funny, funny people. Bill Murray, funny and talented. Uh, I just didn't think the show was all that hot. I think they had a, um, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned a lot of those people. I, I think they had some funny comedians in Caddyshack. Oh, definitely. And Caddyshack is a lot of fun. Yeah. It's actually a lot of fun. I actually did an interview from Caddyshack. I had the beautiful Cindy Morgan on here from that. Who played Hubba Lisa? Hubba. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was a lot of fun to talk to, and um, uh, I remember she relayed the story. I guess Ted Knight did not enjoy doing the shoot. Oh no! In fact, nobody liked him on the set. He was—he was—he was, he was supposedly a real jerk. Uh, but then again, they say that about Chevy Chase as well. Doesn't have a good reputation. What about uh, Bill Murray? He was—he was the uh, opposite. You know, he would, in fact. I have a, a, a friend, uh, a girlfriend, who um, worked at the hotel they all stayed in. She, she was one of the desk clerks or something, and she dealt with them like every day. And they would all go out afterwards. You know what I mean? Bill Murray and, and some of the nicer people would all go out afterwards. So Bill was, was a lot more human. What about Rodney and Dangerfield? Chase, he was a big star. What about Rodney Dangerfield? Uh, I've heard mixed things about Rodney. Rodney was a, uh, I don't know about during that shoot. I know he was trying to make a good impression because that was a very big movie for him. Yeah. You know, that was a big opportunity for him uh, coming from the nightclubs, you know. Uh, one of the funniest stand-ups ever. Uh, and also, if he liked you as a comedian, he would take you with him. He would make sure you were seen. He was very loyal that way. He did that with Jim I, Carrey. I just hear What's that? He did that with Jim Carrey, I think. Yeah, Jim Carrey was one, and there were there were a few others that that he he was pretty much responsible for helping. I know uh, um, George Carlin speaks very highly of him too, uh, or spoke very highly of him. Uh, but just not from what I understand, he was not a very nice man uh, in general. He was a uh, I, I could tell you the private lives of a lot of the comedians <laughs> out there because I've made a study of it. And uh, you'd be surprised. It would shock you to hear who was not a very nice man. One of the guys that did come from Rodney, though, uh, a very loud guy, was Sam Kennison. Oh, Sam was great. I thought <laughs> Sam was a great comedian. He, in fact, he was part of my group in the Comedy Store Players in the early 80s before he made it. And it was a funny thing uh, because we would do a lot of sketches and stuff. And uh, Sam was a part of that. And then uh, after our show was over... He would get up and test his new stand-up material because he was brand new. He was trying, trying out his stuff. And I remember sitting with a buddy of mine and looking at him and saying, he'll never make it. He screams too much. <laughs> That'll give you an idea. <laughs> you know what? I, I, it's funny because um, I've done a couple interviews from the movie Back to School, 
including uh-huh. Adrian Barbeau and uh, Johnny Vedus Hernandez from Uncle Boinko, who was, who was in the film. And, mm-hmm. of course, uh, Rodney Dangerfield was in that with uh, Sam Kennison. And to me, one of the funniest jokes in Back to School was uh, Sam Kennison playing, not just playing a professor, but he's playing Professor Turgenson, which is kind of the name of the George C. Scott character from Dr. Strangelove. Dr. Strangelove, which I consider probably the greatest comedy of all time. I think Dr. Strangelove was great. I loved Kubrick in general. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, loved yeah, Clockwork Orange. Well, I love, I love Paths of Glory. I love Lolita. Yep. Uh, I especially love uh, Strange Love. Uh, Barry Lyndon is a great film, also. And I love Clockwork Orange. I've got the soundtrack, even. You know, that was very, very different. Controversial, but I loved it. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. It's just, it's just out of... I mean, he made interesting films. You know, even when, when you didn't connect to the, to the um, subject matter, you couldn't look away. Again, it was just so interesting and so visually stunning, usually. But you did, uh, of course, the remake of the producers. Now, I, I like yes. the, <laughs> I like the George or George uh, Mel Brooks version of it. I did yeah. not go to the remake. Um, you didn't miss anything. No. <laughs> oh God, it's terrible. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Uh, the best thing about the film was, uh, first of all, it was a big mistake to let Susan Stroman the director of the stage version who directed me and and all of us Uh, she was the hottest director on Broadway at the time and choreographer and um, what she did was she cast everybody from the stage show to play little parts in the film so the, the film itself I don't even have a copy of it but the film itself is like a yearbook of everybody who was in the stage version so that was kind of cool um I remember the scene I was in, which was the accountant scene. Uh, John Lovitz was playing the part I usually played on stage. And I remember just watching him and thinking, you son of a bitch. (laughs) I'd love to show you how to do this, you know. Um, And I'm a John Lovitz fan. Okay. But, uh, you know, and Mel, that night, we shot at night in New York City. Uh, He was not happy either. He kept sending messages over to Stroman you know, to tell John Lovitz what to do. He didn't want to do it. And I have to say, he was a little depressed at the time because his wife was um, and dying folks. of cancer. Yeah, yeah. She, was past- she was dying of cancer at the time. So uh, I remember trying to cheer cheer him up that night, talking about the Ritz brothers, who he, I told you before he loved mm-hmm. and thought were the funniest ever. And he did. He perked up a little bit uh, when we spoke about that. But uh, the movie itself... Uh, I have a friend who uh, who's actually in a, a Mel Brooks movie, a, a terrible one called To Be or Not To Be. Um, he said that uh, he, he called it the first moving picture he ever saw with no movement. <laughs> uh, the camera was just kind of placed, and it was like watching the stage thing. You know, it was kind of dull. Uh, the best thing about the film to me is, are the outtakes at the end. Of the they producers the during the closing credits, the producers are to be or not to be. Producers, okay. Yeah, I didn't even want to talk about to be or not to be. I thought that was an, <laughs> an abortion, an abomination. Watch yeah. the original with Jack Benny and Carol Lombard, directed by Ernst Lubitsch, one of the great comedy directors of all time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anyway, I... yeah. So I was in that, uh, and, and uh, don't look for me because I'm one of many accountants, and the choreographer who hated me. Uh, <laughs> wow, he really hated me because I was I was I'm not a dancer, and he was used to working with all these dancers, so he put me behind a pole in the room, and you know what? I, I was very happy to be behind the pole. <laughs> I think some of not the a, not a movie I'm proud of. I think a lot of people in that movie probably wanted to be a behind a pole. Yeah, <laughs> I mean the original had Zero Monstro and uh, uh, Jim yeah. Wilder, who we recently Gene lost, Wilder and, and Kenneth, Kenneth Mars. Mars, and yeah. uh, the, this one here. Um, I mean, you got some talented people. Just uh, Dick Sean, Dick Sean. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I mean, uh, yeah, but even even that movie. Well, I have a few stories about that movie, okay. the original. Okay. Uh, it's not an original idea. The, the, okay. That plot 
of producers uh, getting more money than they needed to invest in a flop. Okay. Uh, was used in a movie called uh, um, New Faces of 1937. Okay, I never heard of that. Learning more yeah. stuff here. Milton Berle was in it. Okay. Uh, uh, a, com- a very popular comedian called Joe Penner. Uh, uh, Her- remember Ozzie and Harriet? Yes, I do. Harriet was the leading lady. Um, and there was a Greek dialect comedian named Park Yukarkis. His real name was Harry Einstein. He's the father of Albert Brooks. Uh, he was in it. And the plot is the plot of the producers. So Mel kind of stole that plot and reworked it in his own way and turned it into the producers. But I think I think that movie peters out like halfway through. You know, I, I, I don't think these scenes of the actual show are funny other than Springtime for Hitler. Uh, I don't think the show does. I, I kind of peters out towards the end, I find. Oh, okay. Just my opinion again. <laughs> oh, you're allowed to have your opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know, I know. We both agree that Pearl Harbor sucks shit. Yeah, yeah. There you go. There, there you go. go. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree with you there. Yeah. Um, but uh, again, I, I'm more proud of my stage work. You know, I, I was in Greece on Broadway. In it's interesting Greece. because I just heard from uh, Barry Pearl tonight, who uh, is uh, planning to come on my podcast. Uh-huh. From the movie, and uh, now he's a dear friend of mine. I, I, of yeah, mine. I'm looking forward to having him on. Funny, the movie Grease. Um, I've done one interview from it already. One of the backup dancers was the beautiful, the as far as I'm concerned, gorgeous uh, um, Antonia Franceschi, and I didn't know she was a backup dancer in Grease when I contacted her. Back in 2015, I wanted to. I, I liked her in Fame, where she played the ballet dancer who got who mm-hmm. got pregnant. And um, I, I, when she sent me her info, I found out that she was a backup dancer in Greece. And I didn't even have to watch Greece to know which backup dancer she was. She was the attractive one. <laughs> Yeah, she was the she was the one you couldn't take your eyes off of. Yeah, and I I told her where I seen her in all all these places in the movie, and mm-hmm. she told she confirmed I got her right. And the only difference was that her hair was dark and grease, where she was kind of a sandy blonde in in fame. Yeah, yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah. it was a good movie. I enjoyed the movie Grease. I, I have to say, the first time I saw it, I didn't really see it. I was with my girlfriend at a drive-in, mm-hmm. and I I didn't see much of the movie but uh, i went back to an actual theater and saw it and i really enjoyed it really enjoyed it and who knew i would become like best friends with the guy who played duty well you know what last time i saw greece theatrically was at a midnight screening and there was guys dressed up like the t-birds and uh yeah and um a whole thing. yeah and but one thing i remember is in the middle of the theater there was a group of females, and they all sang along with Olivia Newton-John when she sang Hopeless, "Hopelessly Devoted to You." Mm-hmm. And I thought Isn't that was that just, interesting. yeah. Well, I, I here here in Los Angeles, well, around the country actually, they they show it um, uh, the sing-along version. They actually run the lyrics while the people are singing on the screen, and the audience sings along. I love going to midnight movies because I find that the crowd is so devoted like i i'm going to tell you, i i saw pulp fiction at midnight uh, a few years back and i mm-hmm. found out like i saw that theatrically when it came out in 1994 and i think it's a great movie but i discovered at the last midnight screening the star of the movie is really samuel jackson because everybody was responding to everything he said and if he wasn't talking they were responding to his facial expressions <laughs> Well, he's just so outrageous, you know? He's, yeah. He's great. He's great in that movie. I, I like him anyway, but he's, he's great in there. And you learn little things like that, you know? And, yeah, uh, yeah. And then you get the <laughs> movies like The Room, uh, discovering people are bringing plastic spoons and tossing them at the screen. And I found out what the significance of that was. I didn't realize that, that when Tommy Wiseau made The Room, uh, mm-hmm. the, prop, he, the prop person brought pictures to put you know or to put around the uh, the 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 place where his characters were living so you know dress the setup 
and yeah. they couldn't he couldn't be bothered to get photographs to put in there and all the pictures came with just these pictures of spoons you know and they just <laughs> <laughs> now when, when people see these spoon pictures they throw plastic spoons at the screen what about tossing the football back and forth wasn't there <laughs> yeah like there are they're, they're in tuxedos outside tossing a football. <laughs> oh, I, I just I, I couldn't believe that film. I just couldn't believe it. But I did thank my nephew, and I'm going to thank him publicly now. Alex, thank you for introducing me to that film because it's hilarious. <laughs> and the guy who wrote a book about it, too. There's a book out there now. Yes, Greg Cicero, and it's being made into a movie. It's coming out this year. Unbelievable. It's called The Disaster Artist, and I guess James Franco is playing Tommy Wiseau. Oh, that's perfect. I think he'd look great. I, I thought that's it's probably I think he he knows that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, I, I like a lot of James Franco's stuff though too. I, I, I just find that he he takes a few risks, you know, uh, as long as he's not um uh subdued by um uh, the studios. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I, I, it it depends on the thing that he's in for me, you know. I remember watching him host the Oscars uh, one year. Okay, uh, he, it was just, hear, yeah. it was unbelievable. It was so bad. Well, I, I thought he was I thought he was on like you know four kinds of drugs or something. I, I just didn't get it at all. Well, he and Anne Hathaway were just kind of poorly matched there. Horrible. Yeah, she was like she was like a cheerleader, and he was like a stoner. You know, and it just didn't work. It didn't work at all. But anyway, um, yeah, the room is just a, a wonderful mess. I just love it. I love a messy room. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> what else, what else, what else? So on Broadway in Greece, I got to play Vince Fontaine. And in this production, I got to do a 45 minute pre-show before every show. Now imagine that on Broadway, I got there at seven thirty. everyone else got, you know, came on stage at eight fifteen, and I got to ad lib with the audience for 45 minutes. I started on the road doing that on the national tour. And uh, sometimes my reviews were better than the shows, which was which pissed a lot of people off. But <laughs> it was so much fun. I mean, that's what I love to do more than anything. When I do a stage show, especially a funny. Do you know a funny thing happened on the way to the forum? I don't know. You never saw the movie with Zero Mostel and every other comic, Phil Silver's. Uh, no, I actually don't know that one. You're you're filling me in on a lot of stuff that. Uh... Wow, it was directed by Richard Lester, who directed uh, Hard Day's Night with the Beatles. Okay, yeah, I know Hard Day's Night. That was great. Oh, check out a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Okay. Uh, especially if you like Zero Mostel, but I get cast in a lot of Zero Mostel roles. Uh, for some, I call it big comedy. You know, he did big comedy. Uh, and that's, you know, when you want big comedy on the West Coast, you call me. I'm the guy who does it. So, anyway, I, I just, I guess every so often I wanted to get something in there about me. Well, um, <laughs> what, what does, uh, you say you're good friends with Barry Pearl. What does he think of your rendition of duty? My what of duty? Your, your, your portrayal of duty. Oh, I don't play duty. I play, I played Vince Fontaine. Oh, Vince Fontaine. Yeah, the DJ. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay, the, okay. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, in the production I did, which was, um, it was on Broadway in the mid-90s uh, for about, oh, God, it ran forever. Uh, and we had every we, got, we had all these stars in it. Uh, Debbie, Debbie Gibson was our Rizzo for a long time. Uh, we had uh, uh, Sally Struthers from All in the Family. Okay. Uh, she was our Miss Lynch for a long time. Uh, I mean, you name it. We had Linda Blair as Rizzo <laughs> for about three weeks. Uh, <laughs> and that was, that was something, let me tell you. Uh, we had uh, Mackenzie Phillips. Uh, oh, yeah, of American Graffiti. Uh-huh. She was Rizzo for a while. Um, who else did we have? Oh, my God, you name it. We, we had them. What was... Uh, yeah. What was Mackenzie Phillips like? Um, smoked like a chimney. I, oh. I know she was giving up drugs, so she smoked cigarette after cigarette after cigarette, and she, she always smelled of smoke. Very hard-edged. Nice. She was very nice to me and very nice to the cast, but she was very hard-edged. 
you know she, she brings a lot of heart i think to american graffiti i always i like the fact in american graffiti that paul lamat mm-hmm. kind is has hard edge and as tough guy like he wanted to be seen by his friends. I like the fact that he kind of watched out for this little girl, you know? Yeah, that was nice. I You're always right. had, I always nice. felt, uh, I always quite taken with that. Do you remember Suzanne Summers in that film? I do. She was the girl in the Cadillac. Uh-huh. Yeah, a small role, but boy, it got her a lot of attention. One of my first jobs in Hollywood when I first came out here back in 1979, I was, I was a baby. Uh, I was one of her assistants at her at, at working out of her home. Okay. And she was she was in uh, the TV show Three's Company at the time. Yeah. And I was there for the time where she walked out of that show, and my God, it was like it was like somebody killed the president. You know, that's how that's how crazy it was. Wow. <laughs> it was so big at the time, and I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it that we're talking about a sitcom here. You know. Yeah. But you... she walked out. Yeah. What what was the story behind that? Now, that's probably been told all over, but uh, I don't well, follow. I was there. I can tell you what happened. Uh, her husband, who was the, he was Canadian. Uh, he had a late night talk show there, very popular. Okay. Before Alan Thicke. Okay. What was his name? I can't remember his name. Uh, I'm kind of lost. Yeah. He was a very big star on television in Canada. Um. And he came to America, married Suzanne Summers, and became her manager. And his demands became so great that uh, it came down to a, I either get this or she's leaving the show. The manager, the uh, television show wouldn't give in, and Suzanne Summers left the show. That's all it was. Major blunder for that show. Yeah, oh, definitely. definitely. It went on for a few more years and uh, with, uh, what's her name, Priscilla... What the hell was her name? Bonner? Uh, Priscilla Bonner? I, I don't remember. I don't remember either. And to be honest with you, even when I was working for Suzanne Summers, I hardly ever watched that show. So I'm not a big TV guy. I, I don't watch no, a lot No, neither of TV. am I, you know. Um, yeah. I just got I my movie. about 1979, actually. I just put my Blu-rays in and I watched that. But, you know. Th- That's go- what I do. Yeah. Yeah. But um, going back to American Graffiti, I often said, and everybody perceives movies differently. I always, um, I told you I come from a a Christian background, you know. I always Uh thought that um, Suzanne Somers in American Graffiti was a reference to Guardian Angels. And I'll tell you why. You never hear her speak until you hear her on the phone to Richard Dreyfuss. But I, I always found, like, he always spotted her. He'd see her, the, the white Cadillac go by, you know, and and he would always just miss her. And yeah, uh, yeah. and it's funny because when he is in the plane and he's flying, he looks out the window and he sees the white Cadillac going along the highway. And I'm sitting here thinking like a guardian angel. She, yeah, know, she yeah. knows where he's going. <laughs> uh-huh. Yep. Always there. Always there, and that, I it was, just kind of great touch. It's definitely a great touch. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I I was always a, a big fan, and often often said, especially promoting the the Doubtfire Challenge on here. I was always a fan of um, messy humor, and I loved the episode of Three's Company where they where they had the food fight, and of course, poor Suzanne Summers being a great sport, you know, got plastered. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> she was a good sport about. I seen actually a a, a video where uh, somebody come up behind her and plastered her with a pie, and she was just such a great sport about it. And I always loved that kind of humor, you know. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me yeah, too. but uh, uh, I I love I love when someone's willing to to get messed up. You know, it it shows a it shows a good spirit, a good sport. Yeah, well, after Robin Williams passed away, I mean, they they, they had the uh, ice bucket challenge, and then there was the um, the doubt for our face challenge for suicide and depression, right? And right. Uh, it, you know, involved taking a pie in the face and nominating right. three people, and it's funny because ALS, I, I got somebody close to me that has it, unfortunately, and. Uh, 
the ALS challenge did so well. Even people that did it without knowing what it was about, it, that uh -huh. raised so much money for ALS. And then the Doubtfire challenge comes out, and I'm like, man, I, I would prefer to see people do the pie thing than the, the ice bucket thing because, you know, like – like the great race had this great pie fight in it, and you had uh, Jack Lemon. I Lemmon. love the great race. Oh yeah, and, and and you know what made the great race pie fight great is that Natalie Wood is this elegant, beautiful woman, and she just gets plastered in it. Yep, yep. And boy, is she plastered at the end. I mean, she's she's multicolored. You know. Oh wait, can I say colored anymore? If you want to. <laughs> it's not PC. Um, no, I, I love, my, you know, it's funny. That movie and It's a Mad, 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 Mad World were two movies that my entire family went to see when I was a, a tiny child. And uh, those, I have such great memories of going with my family to go see those movies and to laugh together. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what made it special. And I wonder if families do that anymore. Well, not mine, although I, I, I still have good, I got good relations with my family, but I'm such a loner mm -hmm. that, you know, like I'll, I'll, I'll go home and I'll uh, stick something in the Blu-ray player and I'll watch it, you know. Oh, yeah, and... I, I understand that. What I'm saying is, uh, or what I'm asking is, I'm talking about, I was, when uh, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World came out, I was about three or four years old. Okay. And I had two older brothers, not much older, and a little sister, and my mom and dad, and we all were able to go see this, this comedy together and laugh together and build a memory together. You know, so I couldn't be a loner when I was four years old. No, you, know, you I couldn't. Was part, of, part of the family. My question is are there movies out there now where entire families go and share them? At a um, Pixar. Those are some of my happiest memories. The Great Race being another one, and uh, Robin and the Seven Hoods with uh, Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack. I remember that one, too. And these were movies that the entire family could go to. Yeah. I think today the Pixar films do. Like the, the, I thought all three Toy Story movies were, were terrific, and they always mm -hmm. bring in everybody. Yeah, I guess I guess movies like that would. Yeah, yeah. Or uh, Finding Nemo. Yeah. Yeah. Or even yeah. like okay. the Muppets. Yeah, and the Muppet movies. Yeah, okay. So that answers my question. Uh, there still are movies being made that the entire family can go see. Yeah, except uh, in my case, um, I don't go to a lot of family-oriented movies because I hate listening to kids uh, act out. And I find it happens a lot in those movies. Yeah, yeah. Like I was too, I forget the film. I think it was, uh, I forget what film. I think it was Cars 2 or something like that a few years ago. There's this kid just running up and down the aisle on, and the parents just aren't controlling the kid. And, and then I, I remember I saw, I don't know who, I saw Bewitched at the theater, and there was this woman brought her baby, and the baby was crying all through it. I'm like, why are you doing this? And experiences like that can really ruin a person's uh, experience. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, they, they, they have no tact whatsoever. Imagine this. I was doing a production. I do, I do a funny thing happen on the way to the forum quite okay. a bit. Uh, and I was doing a show. It's, it's a packed house, you know, and there's a lady in the front row with an infant. And this infant, every so often, is crying, and she's got to shut it up and whatever. She doesn't leave the theater. She, she deals with it there in the front row. So I, I made it a point to, uh, <laughs> to mention it from the stage. From the stage. Uh, and uh, she eventually left the theater and took care of the baby. Oh. But I, I just can't imagine a person's nerve doing that, you know? Yeah, so unless something uh, like... A lot of the Pixar movies I'll go see are Muppets, you know, but I, I find unless, unless something really grabs me, I I don't, or or if I go see a family film, I'll usually go to a late show of it when kids likely are going to be home. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I try to well, avoid them. I, there also, uh, is there still the phenomenon, uh, we had neighborhood theaters when I was growing up, and my neighborhood theater in North Massapequa, New York, um, they had 70s 
Saturday matinees. Every, and I went to the movies every Saturday. My, my parents would drop me off. You know, they'd give me, uh, I don't even want to mention the, how, how cheap it was at the time, but I don't think they gave me more than a dollar or a dollar fifty. And I was able to see usually a double feature and uh, get candy, you know, or popcorn or whatever. Uh, and we spent the entire day at the movies and it was just kids. There were no adults. It was just kids. Is that dead? Is that is that phenomenon dead? I guess. Just wow, curious. What a shame. Do, what a do, shame. do you Some know of what? My happiest memories. I was just curious. Do you remember what the first movie you've seen in a movie screen is? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, it was Son of Flubber. Okay. A Disney movie with Fred McMurray. Okay. And uh, I just remember being enthralled. There's a. Uh, there was a football game at the end where um, one of the players gets filled up with flubber, you know, and he's flying around the field. And I thought it was the funniest thing in the world. I don't think I've seen it since, but uh, it was magical, and it started my my love for film. The Robin Williams version was horrible. Yeah, I, I didn't even see it. I didn't want to ruin, ruin the memory, you know. My first experience, uh, we don't have drive-ins here anymore, but my parents used to take – my brothers and I, the drive-in, and I think the yeah, first... Yeah, we, we used to do that, too. Mm -hmm. The first movie I remember seeing at the drive-in, and I would have been five years old, was Pete's Dragon. Wow. Wow, that's a good one to see at a drive-in. Yeah. We saw that. Yeah. We saw the Star Wars trilogy and Raiders of the Lost Ark, E.T., a few Disney classics. It, it, wow. It, wow. It, that was yeah, always I, fun I remember. I think, I think uh, the first I ever saw at a drive-in was... Um, oh, boy. It might have been... Uh, from Russia with Love, the okay. James Bond movie. Okay. And but here's the deal: I was so young that I re I remember the opening credits, and I believe I fell asleep and woke up just before the ending. <laughs> That's how young I was. So, and we also saw The Music Man with Robert Preston. I think I was like I must have been three. I think I slept through that one too. But uh, but there's still a few uh, there's still a few um, drive-ins in this country. Yeah, I think uh, I heard we have one in Callis. I think I think that's yeah. what I heard. Or so Sussex. What town are you in, Greg? I'm in uh, Fredericton in uh, New Brunswick, Canada. Do you know oh, where New that? Brunswick. Okay. You know where that is? Yeah, I do actually. Well, you are the few people that do. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few New Brunswick, uh, New Brunswick uh, records. Actually, that was a label. Uh, uh, do you remember uh, old 78s? Yeah, records? I do. I do, the little ones, yep. Yeah, New, New Brunswick was a, uh, a major label back then. But uh, we also have uh, uh, New, Br uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey, I think, here. Yeah, I always have to, when I get my guests to plug my show, I always have to say, New, get them to say New Brunswick, Canada, so they don't uh, uh, get confused on it. But have you ever been up this way before? Uh, no, I've been to Toronto and the surrounding areas. I've been to Vancouver, uh, and I've been to Montreal. Okay. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Canada, at least the parts I've seen. And I have a cousin in Toronto. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, here's something I always ask my guests. Uh, about the closest we have to celebrities uh, here uh, would be the Trailer Park Boys. Are you familiar with them? No, I'm not. Oh, man. <laughs> Ivan Reitman produced their first of three movies, but their, te oh. their television season has gone over 11 seasons. Oh, wow. See, I'm not a I, – again, I don't know about television. I'm a uh, uh, – Back in 1979, I, first of all, I grew up watch. I was like, television was like religion to me when I was growing up. And I, I actually memorized the TV guide. Mm -hmm. And my brothers would like show me off to their friends and say, name any time, any channel, he'll tell you what's on. And I was able to. Uh, so I watched a lot of TV. And then it got to be around 1979. And I just said, you know what? I'm not going to let TV run my life anymore. And I am very selective about what I watch now. And what, what do I you watch? You, I, it's not much. <laughs> well, um, 
here in Canada, one thing I would like to see happen is the film industry uh, regain its footing. Because there, there was a time, like I've interviewed a lot of great Canadian talent on here. And mm-hmm. um, I, uh, I remember there was some really good uh, Canadian films that has been made here. Uh, that It was nice to know that they were our films, you know, they were made here. Not, yeah. not something that was like... Um, like Deadpool, for example, I guess was shot here, but it's it's an American film. Whereas yeah. something like you know Black Christmas and uh, uh, Which class, I enjoyed. yeah, I did two interviews from it. Mm-hmm. Yep, I had Nick Mancuso and uh, Lynn, Griff- uh, Lynn Griffin both on here from Black Christmas. Hated mm-hmm. hated Wasn't, the. Uh... Was just the one with Andrea Martin. Yeah, that. Well, she was in both of them, but uh, yeah, she, but uh, a stranger calls or something like that. Oh, I like when a stranger calls. Yeah, with Carol Me Kane. Too. That was good. One of my favorites is John Carpenter's Halloween. Oh, that's a that's a good movie. That 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 scared the bejesus out of me when I when I first saw it. Yeah, I loved Halloween. I didn't care for the sequels much, mind you. Nah. But yeah. I liked the original. It was done with such skill. And Brian De Palma's done a lot of good ones, too. Like, I really like Dress to Kill, for example. Oh, yeah, me too. I, I call it Hitchcock White. Yeah, yeah. And even you know? his granddaughter had said that she, she even uh, liked a lot of uh, the De Palma stuff. Yeah, well, it's it's well done. Certainly well done, that's for sure. Yeah. But uh, we used to have a lot of really good Canadian stuff done here. Like I said, Black Christmas, Class of 1984, which I did three interviews from. I enjoyed yeah. that. And, uh, you know, Meatballs and uh, <laughs> Bon Cop, okay. Bad Cop, huh? Now, Meatballs, wasn't that um, Harold Ramis? Um, he didn't direct it, but he, I, I believe he wrote it. Uh, yeah, he Ivan, wrote it, and Ivan Reitman directed it. I did an interview from that, too, the beautiful Christine DeBell uh, I interviewed oh, yeah. from that. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't that have... Name, DeBell. Yeah, we didn't have camp counselors like her whenever I was going to camp. No, of course not. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I, I went to camp only one year, and I, I it was too uh, controlled for me. I was, I was a little too uh, spontaneous for camp. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I would like to see the Canadian film industry, like, just, you know, um, I guess because the government here doesn't, uh, do much for uh, to support it, but I I think that we could really I, I'd like to see that come back where where oh, yeah because um, yeah, I know a lot of people love to shoot stuff here yeah and well God you, I mean we for years were using uh, Toronto as New York yeah you know. I mean, that it, it became a thing for a while. Actually, it's funny you mentioned that because I heard uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Eight, Jason Takes Manhattan, was shot in Vancouver, and they had to, they had to make a Vancouver. And we, 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 I remember seeing it and laughing because it was like, "Come on, get out of here!" <laughs> yep, you know. Oh yeah, but uh, listen, I, I'm very sorry, Greg, but I'm going to have to break away. I, you know, we've gone an hour and a half. That's how entertaining you are. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> Stephen Joyner does not lie. He told he told me you go two hours. We don't have well, to go two hours. I actually could. I mean, I'm really enjoying our conversation. But I am I too, to but very, I'm learning a I lot. To be honest with you, I haven't had any dinner, and I'm starving. <laughs> so I really need to eat some dinner. Yeah. Well, you know what? Um, no, Steve. Uh, Stephen Joyner told me that uh, I was going to enjoy talking to you. And when I had you on the phone there and you started trashing Holy Man and the producer, I was like, <laughs> I, I had to get you on. Like anybody that's willing to trash their own stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but do, do well, you... I mean, I feel like I really do feel like uh, we haven't covered my career, really. I mean, we've talked about a few bad movies and stuff and I, I brought up Broadway, but you know, it's it's like I, I there was a lot of stuff I've done. I, I've been in the business. Actually, it's it's my forty third anniversary. Forty three years. I started when I was in my teens, doing stand up comedy, and uh, you know, although I'm not a household name by any means, I have had an interesting ride. <laughs> it has been an interesting ride, uh, ups and downs, and all around. So, it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. Well, you can always come back on at some point, you know. That'd be fine. I'd love to. It's great talking. 
Tech. I mean, really, you're a very entertaining guy. And uh, how long have you been on the air? I've been, well, I've been reviewing movies since 1996, but I got to introduce to CHSR here in 2005. So uh, I've been here since 2005, and uh, I started podcasting, uh, doing these interviews in 2015. Well, I could see why you've been on for so many years, really. It's just very entertaining. This is something I would listen to. Yeah, well, I've got, like I said, right currently uh, 50 of my interviews on my YouTube channel. So, I mean, you could... Well, I'm going to check some out. Yeah, but um, no, if you if you got uh, could spare a few more minutes, is there a- anything that you did want to plug that uh, we didn't cover? Well, we've got The Adventures of Biffle and Schuster coming out. And starting in September... Uh, I'm part of a show. Did you ever see a movie called American Hot Wax? I haven't, but I know what one you're talking about. Fran Drescher's in that, isn't she? Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of great rock and rollers and, and all that stuff. Oh, I know the what guy, movie. Yeah, I know what movie you're talking about. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, the director uh, of that movie is a guy named Floyd Mutrix. Okay. And uh, he's done a few movies. If you look him up, he's, uh, you know, Aloha, Bobby and Rose and stuff like that. Uh, Freebie and the Bean is another one. These are movies from the 70s. Um, He wrote uh, a show that won the Tony Award here on Broadway called Million Dollar Quartet. Now, it's it's touring internationally right now. It's a big, big hit. And uh, it's about, uh, you've heard of Sun Records? And Elvis Presley, where he started. Um, it's about the day that Elvis, Johnny Cash, uh, Roy Orbison, and Jerry Lee Lewis, I think I got them all right, got together and just jammed. It was like a jam session. And uh, it, it, was, it was a huge show. Well, he wrote another show about Elvis called Heartbreak Hotel, and I'm involved in that. And that's going to open here Actually, in uh, up in in Maine, a place called Agonquit, okay, uh, where Million Dollar Quartet started, and uh, that's going to be a big deal. It's it opens in September. Uh, it's playing through to October, and then it's supposed to go to Chicago for a long run, and then a national tour. So, uh, everybody who's listening, if you're going to come down to the states, look for a show called Heartbreak Hotel. It's about Elvis's early days. Yeah, and this this should podcast out, too, uh, here at CHSR, but just in time for that, so it's perfect timing. Absolutely, yeah. Come to think of it, yeah, this will be September. So, yeah. happy September, everyone. Happy happy autumn. Yeah, even though we're in April right now. <laughs> shh, 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 don't sign in. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm going to uh, go and uh, have some din-din. And uh, I thank you very much, Craig. This was a lot of fun. Well, before you go, would you mind doing a plug for my show? Not at all. Yeah, just state your name and that you're listening to Greg Gilbert. My show's called Python's Paradise, Python Like the Snake. And, of course, I'm in New Brunswick, Canada. Okay. You want me to do it now? Sure. Hi, everybody. This is Nick Santa Maria, and I've been talking to Greg Gilbert on uh, Python what? Paradise? Yep. Let me do it again. (laughs) Hi, everybody. This is Nick Santa Maria, and I've just been having the most interesting conversation with Greg Gilbert on Python Paradise uh, and from New Brunswick, Canada. And I got to tell you, this guy's on the ball. And not only is he a film fan and an aficionado of uh, great stuff, he's a great guy and an entertaining guy. So give it a listen. Well, you know what? I'll I'll have some time down the future, you know. Uh, if not if not later this year, then definitely uh, early next year. I'll I'll have you back on, and I love uh, it. yeah, I know I know. I've heard Howard Stern a few times. We'll be talking to guests, and uh, they'd run out of time, and uh, they never get to the 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 meat of the subject, you know. So even professionals like Howard Stern fall, fall into that. So. Yeah, ne- next time, uh, you know, we- we'll get more detail, but, uh, you know. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, t- I'm not complaining. I'm, sure. I had a great time. <laughs> well, I'm having a great time, too, and I want to especially say thank- a special thank you to Stephen Joyner for hooking this up. Thank you, Steve. He's a yep. heck of a guy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Nick, thank you so much for coming on, and I wish you the very, very best on your production. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Greg. And I wish you all the best with your show. Continued success. And uh, I look forward to when we can talk again. 
Well, when you do do that production, are you gonna be like uh, giving out free Blu-rays of uh, uh, beach uh, uh, race? <laughs> I want to make friends. <laughs> <laughs> With uh, each Blu ray. <laughs> well, Nick, you have yourself a great evening. Enjoy your dinner and um, uh, God bless you. Hey, you, Kyle. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Take care. Yep. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>